The latest news out of the crypto markets, the SEC sues Binance and Coinbase. So this comes out of uh, a period of very little news, and now we have a lot. Ron Neuner is here to break down the news in the crypto markets and what this lawsuit means for crypto investors. Ron Neuner is the host of the Crypto Banter Show. Welcome to welcome back. It's always good to see you. Thank you. Dave, thank you very much for having me. And as I'm glad you opened it up like that, saying, you know, we were in a period in crypto where there was the volatility had gone to a low that we hadn't seen in something like two or three years. The volumes have dried up. The price action has dried up. And I think a lot of people came into crypto because of the action that the, the, that they, the price action that they got in crypto. And I think that we got to a period where there was zero volatility. And just when you think that there's zero volatility, we then get not one, but two actions by the SEC in a span of less than 20 hours. One of them against Binance, the biggest exchange in the world, and then the other one against Coinbase, which is the biggest exchange in, in, in the United States. All right, so let's break down this news coming out of uh, Binance. The Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, filed 13 charges against Binance, the world's largest exchange. Uh, one of the allegations was that uh, CZ... Uh, had his uh, own exchange work to subvert their own controls, quote unquote, to allow high net worth individuals and U.S. investors to continue to trade on Binance's unregulated international exchange. Uh, can you? So we don't have to go through all of the allegations, but let's just comment on the main ones. Has Binance indeed broken any U.S. securities laws? So I guess time will tell because we don't know what happened in Binance, and I think that will go through the court process now. But I think the two, the two charges or the two actions against the two different exchanges are very different in nature. If you look at the Binance action, it's 13 charges and the charges range from trading and trading and promoting unregistered securities to um, commingling of customer funds, which is, you know, which has become a very dirty word in crypto, specifically after uh, FTX and, and what happened with FTX. Um, to, like you're saying, knowingly and will, willingfully and knowingly assisting customers in bypassing the US uh, uh, regulations to be able to trade um, securities in, in the United States and sometimes even, even perpetuals and derivatives. So there's 13 charges. We're not going to go through each one of the charges. But suffice to say that, you know, it's a very different, they're very different in nature from the charges against Coinbase, which I'm sure we'll go to in a couple of seconds. The interesting thing around the Binance charges is that CZ and Binance then came out and said that they have actually, that they were actually quite surprised that the SEC uh, started this action because they've been engaged in good faith with the SEC for the last two years. We also heard that behind closed doors, they were already negotiating a settlement before this came out. So quite interesting that the SEC did this. And I guess now we need to see how this plays out. I think the important thing for the viewers to note is that these the SEC the SEC's actions are civil in nature they're not criminal in nature and usually or often I won't say usually but often civil cases by the SEC that allude to some kind of criminal activity which is I guess if you look at things like commingling of funds and knowingly and willfully willingly assisting customers to bypass US uh, uh, safeguards and regulations, I guess you could think that those may actually be criminal in nature. And I guess what the crypto market is now worried about is the crypto market is now worried about whether we're going to get criminal action against CZ, Binance, BAM, or any of the, the other entities. Uh, this tweet came in from CZ literally one minute ago as we're speaking. Uh, he tweeted, they didn't sue FTX. I guess the implication here is that this lawsuit doesn't mean anything because the SEC hasn't seen real issues when they should have. Um, so yeah, time will tell if the if if CZ has broken any securities what? laws. Well, yeah, what what there's do you a, think is going to happen? Yeah, pl please. There's a lot in that tweet, David. There's a lot in that tweet. So the first thing is in that tweet, you can hear that CZ is very, very, very frustrated with the SEC. He's very disappointed. I know CZ. He's a very calm, level-headed guy. But in the last couple of days, he's tweeted that tweet and a couple of other tweets. In fact, yesterday, I think he tweeted something. I'm going to see if I can, if I can actually uh, uh, find the tweet here. But he tweeted some, something along the lines of uh, who has protected you more, the SEC or, or Binance? And he, he ran a poll like that on his, on his Twitter account. If you allow me to share my screen, I'll actually show you the other tweet he tweeted yesterday. 
Um, he says, wonder if Gary Gensler ever reads the comments under his post from the consumers he's supposed to protect. And if you do look at under the post, there's a lot of really bad comments about, about Gary Gensler. So that is how um, CZ has come out. In stark contrast to that, I'm going to quickly just try and find the um, the response from Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. And this is a response from, from, from Coinbase here. And he says, regarding the SEC complaint against us today, we're proud to represent the industry in court to finally get some clarity around crypto rules. He says, remember, the SEC reviewed our businesses and allowed us to become public in 2001. There's no path to come in and register. And he goes on and he, he lists this whole thing. And I'm sure we'll talk about the Brian Armstrong and uh, Coinbase uh, case. But I think that what I'm trying to illustrate here is that you're now getting two different approaches from two different companies. CZ seems frustrated. He seems angry. He seems a little bit emotional, which is not the CZ that, that I know. And Brian Armstrong is attacking this in a very, very, very systematic way, which we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Yeah, we'll talk about Brian Armstrong in, 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 in just a bit. But remember, now, Binance was sued by the CFTC not too long ago, at least six or seven weeks ago. That The nature of that suit is different as well. Can you comment on the similarities and differences here? Well, look, they're both civil suits. So there are two civil suits now, one by the CFTC and one by the SEC, each one of them containing their own, their own individual charges. We also know that the Department of Justice has said that Binance is under investigation. They haven't brought any charges on Binance, but we do know that Binance is under investigation by the Department of Justice. So I think very important to note that these are both civil claims. And civil claims are usually resolved in either in the courts, in which case the judge makes a decision as to who's right and who's wrong. But more often, they are resolved in settlements. And I, I mean, if you, if you look at the history of the SEC and the CFTC, these civil claims against financial institutions in, the, in say, the banks and, and, and the traditional sector uh, are, are really like part of the game. You know, they happen all the time and these, these, these penalties and, 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 and fines happen quite a lot. I think in crypto, we're just new to it. And so the market kind of like went, oh my goodness, you know, the SEC is being sued. But, you know, if you're in traditional financial services, this happens all the time and it gets resolved. It takes a long time to get resolved. It can take a couple of years. And even in crypto, when you look at the Ripple XRP slash SEC case, uh, you realize that, that that has taken multiple years and still is, I won't say nowhere near resolution, but certainly not anywhere close nowhere close to to being resolved so i think what you asked what happens here next what happens here next is that we hope that there's no criminal action against cz finance etc uh, in the absence of criminal any criminal action we wait many many years for this thing to resolve itself either in the court of law or in um in in some kind of settlement but i i think that that's pretty much what happens next i was Going through uh, CZ's Twitter, he retweeted um, uh, an analyst who pointed out a chart, which is that their exchange reserves ha have not fallen. Many people aren't withdrawing all their holdings on Binance as we speak. Um, is that, first of all, is that something that you've noticed? And is, what does that speak to in terms of the confidence of uh, or towards Binance? So I'm going to share my screen again. I just want to show you this is the exchange transparency chart, they call it. And what you can see is that in the last one month, the net inflows into Binance are $1.2 billion. Yes, in the last 24 hours, $1.7 billion has left Binance, but there's still $52 billion in there, which means that less than 2% of Binance's reserves have left Binance. What does that mean? Well, it means that people aren't really scared of a bank run. Now, very, very, very important that we highlight this. As part of the SEC's document, and I'm going to try and find this document for us, um, the SEC requested, asked the court to get an injunctive action against Binance to freeze all their international assets. And the reason why the, they believed that the court may grant this, or they believed apt that they include this in the document, is because, because they believed that there was no real differentiation or separation between Binance International and Binance US, they argued that the two were linked. And if the two are linked, they could argue that they could get this injunctive relief or an injunction to freeze all of Binance's assets. Now, they have 48 hours to do that in. And 
I don't think it's actually going to happen. I mean, I think the chances are very, very, very slim. In fact, the market's telling you that the chances are very slim because right now, no one is, well, two and a half percent of, of, of finances reserves were actually withdrawn in the last 24 hours and net net in the last 30 days, their reserves are actually up. So, I, I mean, it's important to, to highlight that that is a very small risk, but not one that we think will actually materialize. It's interesting because today also the Bitcoin price is up something like 3.4% right now. I'm looking at the screen. I understand the NASDAQ and the S&P, they're both up. So risk assets are going up today. But you, you would think that news like this would uh, create a divergence. But no, Bitcoin's up. Very, 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 very smart uh, 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 observation. I quickly want to take you to the Bitcoin chart. And I want to show you a few things just for, for, the, for the people that are, that are watching the charts. So the first thing to notice here is that when we started the day yesterday, Bitcoin was at about 27,000. We're now 26,900, which means that we've clawed back the entirety of the, um, of the loss that came, that came out yesterday. Another point is this red line on the chart is the 200 week moving average. It's the most significant Bitcoin momentum indicator. It's, and as you can see from this chart, Bitcoin has always been above the 200 week moving average except for three times um, in its history. The longest time that it's been below is in the last bear market, starting just after the, or starting just before the FTX collapse. Now, why do I say that that's important? Because yesterday, we actually dropped below the 200 week moving average on the break of this Binance news. And because it's a weekly indicator, we don't actually pay attention to it until the weekly close. Now, before the weekly close, we now have Bitcoin going back up. So that's if you look at the charts. Now let's ask, what actually happened and why did the market respond like this? Very simple. I was watching the charts. In fact, when Coinbase, when the SEC went for Binance, the chart went from 27,000 to, let me just quickly show you this in the charts. The chart went from 27,000 or whatever it was, all the way down to 25,300. When the SEC, when the news broke of Coinbase, the the chart was at 26,500 which was quite near to the quite near sorry uh 25,500 which was quite near the lows when the, the the coinbase news came out the price of bitcoin started to rise what is that telling you telling you that the market says that if they were going against binance that was a big risk it was a big risk to crypto because binance is the biggest exchange in the world but the fact that they went for Binance and Coinbase around uh, it, within 20 hours of, of each other shows that the SEC is after crypto. And I think what the market is celebrating here is they're saying, you know what, we're not going to get regulatory clarity from the SEC. They certainly don't want to talk. And, and we'll, 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 I'll show you a few things when we get to the Coinbase section about, how, uh, about, about the facts here. But I think what the market is saying, we're now going to get regulatory clarity. And the market is excited about the fact that they're going to get regulatory, regulatory, regulatory clarity. And that is why they're saying, you know what? It's, it's not an attack against Binance. It's a, an attack and an agenda against crypto. And we believe that now is the time that it's going to be resolved. And that's, I think, what's, what's playing out here. How is Binance going to fight back? How is Binance going to fight back? They've got the best lawyers in the world. They've got the best civil and actually the best criminal lawyers in the world. And I guess that they're going to fight back charge by charge. And um, if I were a betting man, I would bet that they're going to eventually get to a very big settlement, a settlement that's going to be historic, uh, specifically in crypto. I wouldn't be surprised if that, if that um, settlement is over a billion dollars. But I kind of believe that that would be where they would land up on the 13 charges. I mean, I'm, I haven't been in Binance and I don't know how the business operates, but I know that any business that started off in 2017 when there's no regulatory clarity and built a huge business in a very short period of time probably didn't have the right systems and processes in place to abide to the letter of the law and specifically where the law is very, very, very unclear. So I would imagine that some mistakes were made. However, I think that Binance has cleaned up its act now. And I think that today it's a much cleaner shop than it was back then. I think another point that's very, very, very important, and we haven't touched on it yet. In both the Binance um, allegations uh, or the Binance action, 
and the Coinbase action. The SEC make certain claims and assumpt- uh, certain claims, and I want to show you some of these claims. So in this say they say Binance launched since the the Binance platform's launch, defendants have made available for trading on them crypto assets that are offered and sold as investment contracts and thus as securities. These this includes but is not limited to BNB, which is the Binance coin, BUSD, which is the Binance US dollar. Those are not surprises. But then they go on and talk about Solana, ADA, which is Cardano, Matic, Filecoin, Atom, which is the Cosmos token, Sandbox, Mana, which is Decentraland, Algorand, Axie Infinity, and Coty. And so without ever previously having specified that those are securities, this is the first time that we now learn that all of these are deemed by the SEC to be securities. And they repeated the same thing in the Coinbase in the Coinbase uh, uh, action, where they said that Coinbase actually listed, they named the same tokens or similar tokens, and they said Coinbase listed a whole lot of these unregistered securities. So what the S- SEC has done is instead of going to Solana, to Cardano, to Matic, which are all actually decentralized and there's nowhere to go to, they've now gone and said, these are all securities. And that has huge implications for the industry because that effectively means that any US exchange won't be able to trade these tokens unless they're a licensed securities dealer and you can't be a licensed security de- dealer and trade in crypto in the United States. There's just simply no way to register. So very, very, very interesting. Well, actually, the Canadian uh, regulators about two months ago, uh, they've actually banned uh, the trading of proprietary exchange tokens in Canada. So uh, I don't know if that was the reason Binance pulled out of Canada. I think there was a host of other reasons. But certainly, suppose Binance were operating in Canada, just hypothetically, uh, BNB wouldn't be allowed to be traded. So I don't know. The U.S. is taking a similar route. BNB is one thing, but Solana is actually very similar to Ethereum. And Cardano is actually very similar to Solana in that you know, they they all decentralized blockchains, which are not private, which, you know, I mean, you know, there's really no difference between Solana and, and Ethereum. And there's no difference between Cardano and Ethereum, you know? Um, and so the fact that the SEC have now labeled these as securities is, is another big story that, you know, I think people are so shocked by the news that no one's actually talking about, hold on a second, our favorite tokens, these are all in the top 20 or top 30 tokens are all securities now. Are, are you SEC. surprised? Are you surprised that U.S. regulators, just going back to the proprietary exchange tokens, are you surprised that the the U.S. regulators have not yet banned no. proprietary exchange tokens following uh, the collapse of FTX uh, and, and what FTT was being used for? I think there's a lot in CZ's tweet where he says, you know, they didn't they didn't uh, take any action against FTX. So I think now, there's that you know they have egg all over their face, and now they have to overreact. To, to to fix what they're saying. So am I surprised? I wouldn't be surprised if, they, if all exchange tokens were deemed as securities in the United States very, very soon. In the United States, actually, everything's a security. I mean, according to Gary Gensler, everything except Bitcoin is a security. He was on Bloomberg or CNBC today, and I think he, he said something like, we don't need any more digital currencies. We already, we already have the US dollar, and it is, for the most part, digital. He said this on a TV interview today. So, okay, that that that's telling in itself. So bottom line, do you think Binance is going to be the next next FTX? I understand that's a loaded question. I'll let you break that, that, break that down however Def- you like. Definitely not. And I'll tell you why. I think, that F- I think that FTX, from all the evidence that we've seen up until now, was an absolute scam and a fraud. I think Sam Bankman-Fried, if the charges are correct, took in money to, to FTX, moved the money to his own proprietary investment firm and invested the money and did a very bad job investing the money and therefore lost a whole lot of users' money and the money wasn't available. I don't think that that's the case with Binance. I suspect that Binance made a couple of regulatory mistakes, but at the time the law wasn't clear and they were a very young company. I don't think that they maliciously scammed or are insolvent. And so I think that there's a very, very, very big difference. Um, how does Again, how does this end or how does this play out in the absence of criminal charges i think that this is just a penalty and i don't even think it gets to court to be honest i think there's too many charges here and there's not enough to fight and i think the more logical one that actually goes to court is coinbase and we'll talk about the coinbase one now but i think that's the one that is more logical to get to the court and to be honest if i were to choose a fighter 
in the name of crypto, I would rather choose Coinbase to go and fight this battle than CZ to or, or, or Binance to fight this battle. Yeah, let's talk about Coinbase now. Just an issue with the timing. Remember that Coinbase was given a Wells notice about a month ago, so I don't think it's anybody surprised that eventually the SEC followed up with an actual suit. Uh, whether or not the, the, the timing of Binance and Coinbase getting sued pretty much the same week uh, it's a coincidence. We can. Do, you, you've already given your opinion on that. Um, I, I don't know, but it's an interesting it's observation you brought up. Uh, <laughs> the SEC it's has alleged. It's not a coincidence, and it's not a surprise. So, why is it not a surprise? Because they had a Wells notice, and a Wells notice has a certain time period by which you have to act. So we were. Ex- I mean, we weren't expecting the Wells notice to go and 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 acted upon. So we knew something was coming. Also, if you look at the allegations against Coinbase, the allegations are much more vanilla. There's no commingling of funds. There's no, there's none, there's no shenanigans. The only allegations are pretty much broken down into four that they operate as an unregistered broker since 2019, that they deprived investors of the disclosures and protections that come from registration, exposing them to significant risk, that they trade certain securities on their platform, like Solana, Cardano, Matic, Filecoins, all the tokens that we spoke about before, and that they have a staking program, which includes five stakeable assets, which means that those are investment contracts and that wasn't registered. Those are the only four charges they have against Coinbase. That's why I say that if anybody's going to go and fight this battle, let's go and play. I think if I were to, if, if I were to use an analogy here, with Coinbase, it's playing the ball. With Binance, it's playing the man. And I think it's like with Coinbase, it's it's we're playing the ball. It's fair game here. Let's go to the let's go to court and let's determine who's right and who's wrong. With 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 Binance, I think there's a lot, the 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 water is a lot muddier. And I was quite excited uh, later on in the day when uh Brian Armstrong actually responded. And I, I want to show you two things that I'm very, very, very excited about. Uh in in the first thing is true leadership for the industry. Brian Armstrong came out and said, regarding the SEC complaint against us today, we're proud to represent the industry in court finally to get some clarity around crypto rules. That's already big for me. That is showing true leadership and saying, you know what, if we ain't going to get the regulatory clarity that we need from the SEC, we're going to eventually take this to court and we would rather be the ones that go to court. He says, remember, The SEC reviewed our business plan and allowed us to become a public company in 2021 before they became a listed company. Two, there is no path to come in and register. We tried repeatedly so we don't list securities. We reject the the vast majority of the securities we review. Three, the SEC and CFTC have made conflicting statements and don't even agree on what is a security themselves and what is a commodity. Four, this is why the US Congress is introducing new legislation to fix the situation and the rest of the world is moving to put clear rules in place to support this technology. Instead of publishing a clear rule book, the SEC has taken a regulation by enforcement approach that is harming America. So if we need to avail ourselves to the courts to get clarity, so be it. And then he says something cool. He says, by the way, in case this is not obvious, the Coinbase suit is very different from the others out there. The complaint filed against us is exclusively focused on what is and what is not a security. And we are confident that our facts, we're confident in our facts and the law will get the job done in the meantime. Let's keep moving forward and building an, an, an industry, building as an industry. America will get this right in the end. That is, in my opinion, absolute top leadership displayed by Brian Armstrong. And again, if it's going to be a fight in the courts, I'd rather go in there and have a clear fight that we can win. I'll show you another thing, which I was really, really impressed by, by the leadership of Brian Armstrong. Um, it is a marketing piece that they've, they, that they put out today. Now, they've put out multiple marketing pieces recently, which shows that they're being very smart and they are being very well advised and very well followed by a good marketing consultancy company. And this is what they've published. And I'll play it quickly. Um,
Why am I so excited about this? Well, I'm excited about it because he's broken down the numbers and he's putting down the facts in numbers on the table. Let me just switch this off. Uh, he's putting down the facts in and numbers on the table to show how hard they've tried and what they're getting out of it and what the implications are. And I think that that's true leadership in terms of, you know, using facts and logic to try and solve the problem instead of using emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. They didn't directly, the SEC didn't directly accuse them of commingling funds, uh, but they did uh, accuse them of commingling uh agency roles. So Gary Gensler said in a statement, we allege that Coinbase, despite being subject to the securities laws, commingled and unlawfully offered exchange, broker dealer, and clearinghouse functions. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know exactly what the implications of that are. If you're commingling functions, uh, whether or not you are even able to, uh, but certainly that may imply that funds are being used for multiple purposes. Does it not? Uh, not funds. I don't think there's any allegations in terms of funds. I think that maybe that that they didn't break up the thing. I don't think there's any allegations in terms of commingling of funds. It is more they performed functions which they should have registered for, but they had not registered, and because there's no way to register. So I mean, yes, Gary Gens says there's a very clear way to register. There's no way to register. So they're they're accusing them of doing something that they couldn't do, of not doing something that they couldn't do. Yeah, that's where the disconnect is because Gary Gensler goes out on, on, on national TV and on Bloomberg and whatever else and says, well, they know what they need to do. They just need to register. But even inside the SEC, commissioners are writing public dissent saying there is no way to register. And you know this. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, look, Dave, net net. The US has lost its lead when it comes to crypto. I showed two charts on a show that I did yesterday which showed the exchange volume in the United States versus the exchange volume in Asia. And I think if I can get those charts, if you just give me one second, let me show you these charts because these are very, very, very scary charts. And I think that they really paint a picture, which I think you need to see and the viewers need to see. And then I want to just, I, I, I want to, I want to walk you through this. Um, I want to walk you through this. And then more importantly, I want to walk you through what the implications of this are. So this is exchange traded volume. Um, Hold on, let me just move this out the way. So this is exchange traded volume one year ago. One year ago, 64% of crypto volume was done in Asia and 27% was done in the United States. Fast forward 12 months, 82.5% of the volume is done in Asia and 10.3% is done in America. That's a very, very, very scary number. The other thing that you need to look at here is that 0.8% of the volume was done in Europe a year ago and about 4% is now done in Europe. What is this telling you? Well, Europe is starting to open up crypto regulations and give clear guidelines. Japan is inviting crypto companies in. Hong Kong has opened itself up to retail trading and that is kind of a mandate from China because Hong Kong would never act without China. So what did I do? On my platform, on my show, I got three big investors in the East who are Asians or invest in Asia and two of them were domiciled in Hong Kong. And I asked them, Walk me through what's happening in Asia versus what's happening in the United States. I know you guys go to conferences in both, and they said, very simple. We just went to Austin and we just went to coin to uh, um, Miami, Bitcoin Miami 2023. And what it feels like, it feels like it feels like the, everyone's there, but they've been through a 12 round boxing match. That's the spirit. They've been I, I was, I was there. I, I know what you mean. They said in Asia, it's very different. When you're in Asia, it's hungry and there's an appetite and people are, are welcoming and they're focusing on the right things. And it clicked for me because I was there and you were there too. And we felt it. it what it felt, it felt like, it felt like crypto investors were tired from, from the fight. And uh, you know what, I, I, um, I love this. I tweeted it earlier today. I just think it's 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 so apt for what we're talking about now. I wasn't actually going to show it, but I, I guess we can show it. Um, this is what U.S. investors, in my mind, this is how I feel when I go and see U.S. It's it's very interesting because the price of whatever Bitcoin or whatever crypto is the price. It's the same price everywhere. I wonder why there's a difference of attitude simply because you're in a different geography. Because in Asia today, and specifically in Hong Kong and other places in Asia, it's open and you can do what you need to do without having to get five lawyers and 
And when you when you do the same thing in the United States, it's loyal. It's, you know, Dave, a lot of our sponsors pulled out of our show. We we do content like you do content. A lot of the, the sponsors specifically asked to be excluded from the show in case they were deemed to have been marketing to Americans. Okay, now, I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. A lot of a lot of sponsors at the conferences pulled out last minute and said, we don't want to be marketing to Americans. In fact, one of our sponsors actually offered us a free stand and said, I'm not going to use it because I'm too scared. Whereas in Asia, there was an event in Hong Kong. Um, not only were Chinese government officials at the event, but over 50,000 people flew into Hong Kong for the event. And they didn't, not all 50,000 attended the event, but there were side events and, and, and everything else. And so I think that what the US is missing out on, Asia is starting to capture. And I think while the US is playing a game of backgammon, I think China is playing a game of Go. Since, and, when, did, well, since when did finance become more free in China than the US? I, I know that's a gross generalization, but that's certainly what we're discussing now. It's just, anyway. It's no, just, I wouldn't go yeah. that far. I wouldn't go no. that far as to say that finance became more free in China. But if you use Hong Kong as a proxy for China or as a testing ground for China, I mean, you know, if you know the if you know the what Hong Kong is, Hong Kong is a territory of China. Um, yes, you but you have a different passport, but it, ultimately it falls under Chinese rule, right? And they have willingly and openly opened up crypto. They started opening up crypto in November, Dave, and we are in June, and they have very, very, very clear guidelines of which tokens are legal, which tokens are not, what stable coins are legal, what stable coins are not, how do you get a license, what the licensing procedure is. It's it's really a tale of two continents here. All right, so what is, you would think, the worst case scenario for Binance and Coinbase? Suppose, hypothetically, they lose these lawsuits. Well, first of all, we know it's gonna be expensive, but hypothetically, let's say they lose these lawsuits. What happens to these exchanges? Okay. Let's look at the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, we get criminal charges against CZ and CZ Binance. Um, that, is the, that is the worst case scenario for crypto. We get a little bit of a bank run on, on Binance and, and that happens. I read this about Coinbase and it is written by a Barclays analyst called Benjamin Budish. And he said, he said the Coinbase uh, lawsuit is largely consistent with his expectations. And with that, he warned that, that in the SEC lawsuit against Coinbase, one of the reliefs that the that, that coin that the SEC has asked the court is that Coinbase disgorge all ill-gotten gains resulting from the alleged violations with interest. In other words, the company would be required to pay a penalty totaling the entirety of the revenues generated from trading in digital securities and interest, and that could be well over six billion dollars in penalties. Now. Do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. Why? Because it's a legal tactic to always ask for very extreme things. So when the judge hands over what the judge actually hands over, it feels like a compromise. That's a, a normal legal tactic. But you ask me, what's the worst case? What I think is the more realistic case? The more realistic case is that finance settle. And if I were to, if I were a betting man, I'd say that they would have some kind of restrictions around operating in the United States, but not internationally. I think that Coinbase take this fight to court. And I think that when Coinbase take this fight to court, eventually we get regulatory, regulatory clarity. And I don't think we're going to get everything that we want, but we're going to get some things that we want and the SEC are going to get some things that they want. And we're going to get regulatory clarity. Remember a few things. Remember that these fights take many years. Many years means many regime changes at the SEC. And what's important to one regime may not be important to the next regime. I'll give you a great example of that. The case between the SEC and Ripple was started in the days of Jay Clayton, and it was handed over to Gary Gensler. And I don't believe that Gary Gensler is as passionate about the Ripple fight as maybe Jay Clayton was. And I think the same thing happens with Coinbase and with Binance. And so the way I see it, Coinbase probably settled the case or won certain parts of it in court. But I think after that, Coinbase get huge, I'm not going to say monopoly, but they become the biggest player 
in the United States and there and therefore in the Western world. And I think that's the prize for for fighting this fight. Um, it's going to be a hard fight. It's going to drain them of a lot of resources. I think very, very important to note that as soon as the SEC did that, 10 states took legal action against Coinbase for violating securities law separate. Separate to the SEC, 10 states, including Illinois, Vermont, Alabama, Kentucky, California, Maryland, Wisconsin, Washington, New Jersey, and South Carolina, all took action against Coinbase. That's that's the fight that Coinbase has got in, on its hands. What what does this mean for the crypto user of these exchanges at the end of this battle? Do we do we see higher fees, lower fees, more stringent KYC procedures, certain coins we can't transact in, perhaps the rise of DeFi, uh, self custody wallets? What do you think is going to happen in terms of changes for the user experience? All of the above literally every single one of the above i think that it becomes a much more regulated industry a much more regulated industry has a higher cost of compliance the higher cost of compliance is inev inevitably passed on to the consumer at some point so i think it becomes a more expensive more regular more regulated industry i think that as a result we get less volatility because regulated industries don't have as much volatility that's why regulation is in place which i think then makes crypto a lot less fun because a lot of the reason why we're here is because we get 2Xs and 3Xs and 100Xs and 10Xs. That's why we're here. And so I think crypto becomes less fun, but we have a much more mature bull market. And I think that what we're experiencing now is exactly that. It's a much more mature bull market. I think we start experiencing a much more mature bull market. I also think that you mentioned correctly that there's going to be the rise of DeFi because, you know, where do you go if you're scared of the centralized exchanges? Well, you go to the decentralized exchanges and you start learning to use crypto the way it was meant to be used which is decentralized. Some exchanges are offering wallets now though. So they're yeah, kind of- Coinbase has a wallet too. Coinbase yeah, has-, has They're mixing has it. Wallet too. Yeah. I mean, while we're speaking, the price of Bitcoin is absolutely flying. It's now higher than it was <laughs> before this regulatory action, believe it or not. I mean, I, 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 know, I know this is hard to believe, but Bitcoin, the, the price of Bitcoin is now 27,200, which is higher than it was yesterday before this action began. Uh, let, let's let's finish off on this then. Your outlook on well, activity. Let's say activity, not just so, so much price. Whether or not we're, uh, renewed interest in the space is going to come this year because of the news we're getting, or because of new developer activity, like the ordinals. We didn't talk about the ordinals today, but we're seeing an influx of new activities and news that we haven't seen before. So I look at one chart, and I don't have a chart on me, unfortunately, but it's a chart of blockchain usage. That's it. And in the chart of blockchain usage today, blockchain usage is the highest that it's ever been. We're in, we're coming out of a bear market. Some people will argue that we're still in a bear market and the usage of blockchain is higher than it's ever been. And that to me is the only chart that actually matters because everything else is noise. If people are using this technology more than they've ever used it and the rate of use and the rate of growth is getting higher and higher, eventually the market is going to have to come into equilibrium. And so for me, that's the only chart that I actually look at. That's That keeps me very bullish. And look, let me be honest with you. It's been very tough to be a bull in crypto. You're getting knocked down on prices. You're getting scams and you're getting a whole lot of scams happening in in in, in the industry, in the market. Um, uh, you, you At the same time, you're getting a lot of regulatory attacks, which make you feel like you're really unwanted. You're like, your industry is really unwanted. You know, let me be honest and let you know on a bit more of the personal side. Like I work really, really, really hard. I've been working in crypto really, really hard full time for seven years or eight years, or whatever the number is. I really believe in the technology, but we've had to go through a lot to get here. Last year, we went through Luna. I lost a lot of money on Luna. We went through uh, Celsius, Voyager. You know, as if that wasn't bad enough, we then had Three Arrows Capital. We had uh, FTX collapse and, and take us down. And I mean, that would, that would be enough to usually knock people out. I mean, that, you know, if you were knocked out after that and prices went down 80%, 90%, that's tough to deal with. Come into this year and you get knocked down, not only by the SEC every, every second day coming with some kind of action, some kind of warning. But then the problem is that you've now got this new technology, which has almost stolen the limelight from crypto because crypto used to be the hottest investment sector in the whole world. It's where all the VC money went to. 
You know how much money has been was invested last year in crypto? Over 25 or over $20 billion. You know how much money has been invested this year into crypto by, by crypto VCs? Less than half a billion dollars. You heard that right. We're halfway through the year. Last year, we had spent over, I think last year was 22 billion was invested. Less than half a billion dollars has been invested. Why? Because there's a new, there's a new beautiful girl in town. Her name's AI. And AI doesn't have the same problems that crypto has. It doesn't have as many scams. And it doesn't have, I mean, it has its own set of problems, but it's not the problems that investors are scared of. And so a lot of the VC money and a lot of the interest has now flowed into AI. So it's almost like, wow, we've been fighting so hard. We got knocked so hard. And now also we are competing for share of money, share of wallet with this new technology that, you know, doesn't come with all the baggage and all the shenanigans that, that crypto comes with. So it's been quite hard, but nonetheless, I remain more bullish than ever, as you can see, because I just look at one chart and that is the blockchain usage and adoption chart. And that's at an all time high, even though the price is not an all time high. And so eventually the two have to meet somewhere. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> as you mentioned AI, I had ChatGPT Chat open. I just typed in a very simple query. I'm going to show the screen. It's a rather long text, so I won't read all of it. Design the perfect cryptocurrency. This is interesting, okay? Designing the, per uh, the perfect crypto requires careful consideration of various factors, including security, scalability, de decentralization, efficiency, and scalability. So I'll just read the top. Well, you gave, wow, I gave. 15, no, 12 uh, certain uh, metrics you would need. I'll just read them. Consensus mechanism, number one. Security, number two. Scalability, speed and efficiency. Privacy and anonymity. Number six, governance. Interoper interoperability. Number eight, user-friendly interface. Number set nine, sustainability. Number 10, regulatory compliance. Number 11, community engagement. Number 12, continuous development. It's important to know that designing the perfect crypto cryptocurrency is a complex and ongoing process. I'm just thinking in, in theory, an AI could start de designing its own tokens. It can. It can. It has, it has actually been done. It has actually been done. One of our analysts has actually done it. It's, it, it, has, it, can actually code it. it can actually code it as well, by the way. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay. Crazy. I wonder if those will sell better than some of the other uh, uh, pet pick coins <laughs> that we talked but about last week. I'll tell you a story about AI. We did a show on AI and one of the tools that we looked at was a tool that can translate um, voice into other languages. And so, you know, after having done the show on AI, I went and used this tool that allows you to, it records your voice, it takes your YouTube videos and it translates them into a whole lot of other languages. And literally within half an hour, I transformed our whole business to be able to launch a Russian channel a Spanish channel, a Korean channel, a Mandarin channel, all of them using my own voice, perfectly dubbed and my lips moving perfectly with the new words. So I'm going to send you that. I'm going to send you the, 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 um, the, the program. And I think that you should launch your Spanish channel as soon as possible. <laughs> using AI. Yeah, hola amigos. Watch my Spanish channel launching very soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, buenos dias to all. I mean, I know, I know you laugh, and I, I know you laugh, but it's actually not. I, I'm I'm hoping I can find something here for you quickly. Um, I'm just hoping that I, that I that I have it here. Hold on a second. I may be able to find it. I just think, I just think that it, if you see it, here we go. Let me let me show you something. So we have a we have a, a a host on our on our channel. His name is Sheldon the Sniper. Sheldon, now remember that with this one we didn't opt for the lip syncing service. We only opted for the basic um, the basic service. And I don't know if you got sound, um, but listen to this. Bien francotiradores. Ahora es el momento de aprender yes, una de las cosas más poderosas que aprenderán en este mercado y entender que este mercado funciona 100% por la emoción. Ahora bien, si usted puede comenzar a detectar la emoción, usted comenzará a ver cuando ciertas personas comienzan a entrar en diferentes áreas. Ahora it sounds like his real voice, too. El dinero en este mercado es saber cuándo comprar y cuándo vender. Y usted puede ejecutar esto. So, I mean, that was, done, that was literally done in a couple of minutes using AI. 
and we didn't opt for the full package. We didn't opt for the facial and the and the lip syncing and, and everything else. We just opted for the very basic, just to see if it would translate it. That's what unfortunately. That's what now crypto is is is, that, is competing against. Would you consider this service? We are using it. We are. Yeah, we okay. actually since then we have contracted with them and we're using it and we're launching a Spanish channel. No, no jokes. We really are. <laughs> wow! Congratulations on your Spanish channel launch. Yeah, Spanish. <laughs> Next we, time we'll do this. We're gonna try two languages or three languages. We're gonna try Spanish, Korean, and Russian. Yeah. We well, you should do it in Mandarin. I mean, just this conversation we're having about cryptos. I think there's a huge demand. I'll give you a personal story. I, I rented a Turo over the weekend. I was traveling with my friends. Okay. The, the 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 owner of the car was Chinese. He asked me what I do for a living, and he said, uh, and I told him, and I said, he said, I I have my own crypto little talk show on YouTube. And uh, this is huge. And he showed me all his WeChat posts, and uh, and, and, and there's a Chinese social media uh, um, a site similar to Facebook. Everyone's talking about crypto now. It's crazy. It's just it's. <laughs> I mean, listen. It, it, I mean, it is. This is. This is. This is. We, we're living in an ama- in an amazing world. We're living in an amazing world. I just hope that we can resolve these regulatory issues so crypto can have its its day, uh, and we can get back to business as usual. Um, and continue the, the bull market. Finally, you're you're talking about this issue on your show as well, right? So you're doing it on your YouTube crypto banter. We can watch that there, but you're also doing it on your Twitter spaces. Is there is there a difference so, in the program here? Yeah, so we do a YouTube show daily. Um, I, I guess you'd probably put a link underneath to our channel, but the, yeah. we do a, a, a crypto show. We do five crypto shows daily. I I host one of them. We've got four other hosts. One of them is how to use AI and in investing. One of them, two of them are charting shows. One of them is a gaming show. I also have a partnership with Mario Norfol and we do a crypto spaces and Scott Melker and we do a crypto spaces every single day at 1015 EST, which we just actually just finished it. It ran for about six hours. Wow. So every day, every day we run a, a, a crypto spaces every single day. So it's just, a, yeah, we, we don't stop. We on a That's mission. Intense. To, it's intense, intense programming. We work as hard as you do, sir. <laughs> I'm only trying to I'm only trying to emulate the success you guys have had but okay uh, so tune in to Twitter tune in to uh, your your YouTube channel uh, we'll, we'll put a we'll put a link in the description below you and I talked about your strategy for Twitter so if you want to listen to uh, Ron's long-term media strategy and why he's pivoting towards Twitter watch the uh, last episode we did together a couple weeks ago up in a month ago I'll put a link to that as well Ron explains in great detail. But thank you for coming on the show again today, Ron. Pleasure is always hosting you. Yeah, that was very informative. Thank you. David, thank you so much for having me, my friend. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.